So the uh, 215 and 201 are two freeways that meet right in the heart of the Salt Lake Valley, right here. And that's right in the industrial area, so there's a lot of uh, truck traffic that goes through there. But it's also a lot of car traffic, too, because the 201 freeway parallels I-80 and is a kind of a bypass route. And then, of course, the 215 is a bypass route for I-50 and eventually connects up with the Legacy Parkway. It's one of the only clover leaves <coughs> I know of in the state of Utah. There might be another one, but I don't know where it would be. And clover leaves have an inherent problem. They have a weave. So traffic enters the freeway, and they want to keep going down the main line now, and then the main line traffic upstream approaches. Well, they want to exit and take the next clover. But clover leaf is especially bad because it has four weaving sections. So if you take a look at this interchange and its inherent engineering problem, which worked great back when they built it in the 70s and 80s and the volume was low, and it still works pretty good now. But you grow the traffic 2% a year through the compounding interest formula through 2036 in the next 20 years. The traffic grows one and a half times. And you end up with a situation that, I kid you not, turns into this in Vissim. So you have the, weaving, the, the highest volume weaving section fails. And that queue starts to fi uh, fill up one of the three-quarter ramps. And then that backs into another three-quarter ramp, which backs into another three-quarter ramp. This is sped up about 30 times reality, so you kind of get the idea. And then eventually it fills the fourth one, and you end up with an infinite delay that backs up all four legs entering the intersection. So it's definitely something that needs to be taken a look at. So um, there's another weaving problem with this interchange. Uh, it's the proximity it has to adjacent interchanges, some of which are very close, um, as, as much as a tenth of a mile with the one with Redwood there. So the study area needs to expand to look at those other interchanges as well. The Redwood one's terribly close. California and 32 West are about a third of a mile, and then you got about a mile and a half with 35. So it's not necessarily a weaving section per se, but they do definitely have influence on one another. So what, we're, uh, what I propose to looking at doing here is saying, OK, well, you can get rid of all the weaving sections in a cloverleaf by just removing two of the three-quarter ramps. So if you pull those out and overlay it with a flyover instead, that takes care of at least the intra-interchange weave problem. And then connect it to rated ramps on the uh, interchanges that are really close. Um, just because, in part, these new uh, ramps, a clover dumps you in really close to the center of the interchange, and you have some time to move around. But now, by the time you come off a 40-foot bridge and vertically come back down um, and try to merge back in, you are at the next interchange. So you have to add a braid. And what a braid does is it just carries that you can see we're looking eastbound on the 201. The traffic coming from 215 is lifted over the off-ramp for 32 west. So now, uh, you know, there is a limitation of this that currently there's probably quite a bit of traffic that exits um, 215 onto the 201 and then exits at 32 West. That can't now. So if we were really taking this study seriously, we'd also need to now expand the uh, study area to, say, Bangator, because they're going to have to exit to Bangator and loop back around and come back through the warehouse area. So if you look at what, if you put all these pieces together, we're going northbound on 215. Um, we're going to go northbound to westbound 201. You put these pieces together, the expanding of the, the 215, and, and then we have kind of a, not necessarily a braid, but a collector distributor system that we've now split off onto. Normally, as you can see below, you keep going straight, you hook around that three-quarter ramp, but instead, we're on a flyover now. And uh, the flyover, there's a time travel benefit right away just because the, the overall distance is shorter now because you just cut right over the top in addition to any uh, delay benefit you'd have. Um, so using as kind of our MOE, we're just going to do travel time. You enter the system from either of the four directions on the freeway. Um, the entry point is before that adjacent interchange. And in each direction, you have three options. You can continue down the freeway. You can hook a left on the, uh, on the freeway that you're merging with or right, giving you 12. And so with the existing conditions, 2016, 100% is our baseline. 
what we're proposing putting in, which you have on the left, uh, the average travel time increases to, uh, by about double with the traffic growing one and a half times. And leaving it alone, it grows about three times. But I got suspicious of this initial design because this initial design was one, kind of like some of the things uh, Sam was mentioning with uh, having to kind of validate your model. I just kind of went in and designed something and said, this will work. But I got really suspicious that these numbers here, 47% the initial travel time to go straight through the interchange, that, that seemed fishy because there, there wasn't really delay before for uh, traffic going westbound on 201. And so I, I realized what we might be having a problem with, um, and that doesn't necessarily answer this one, but just the model in general, is when you solve uh, an upstream delay, that extra volume kicks down the system and jams somewhere else. And then that jam can back back up and do your improvement. As you can see here, we, we fix something somewhere and then uh, it pushed the delay farther down and then it all backed up and it wasn't a problem. So I went back and said, okay, well, let's take a look. I'm gonna go through with the VSIM model and we'll just keep fixing stuff and then we'll see where the next delay is and we'll fix it and so on. So we've added the flyover ramps, we added the braids, we widen. I, I, I didn't feel it needed a, a braid. It seemed to perform fine just adding a widening. You're, you're looking, this map is turned north is to the left, so you're actually looking east is at the top. But then I found the 201 freeway now where the, the ramps come in, you have to widen the downstream freeway from three lanes to five to, to accommodate the two extra lanes because the lane drops would immediately back up. And then right now, this ramp to go southbound onto the 215 is two lanes that drops, has a lane drop in the middle of the ramp, and you add in these extra volumes, and that starts backing up. So I extended that through, and then the only way to prevent the jam from happening was to extend those new lanes all the way to 35, but then you have a double trap lane at 35, and cars didn't like that. And as you've seen with Visim, Visim virtual drivers are really, really bad at changing lanes. They'll just come to a complete stop in the freeway. Um, I don't know if that happens in reality, but it does at least demonstrate where you have a situation where the weaving is so bad that it can cause a delay. So I changed that to a single trap lane, extending it through, and then where, no matter where I dropped this lane, it caused a delay, so I finally just pushed it through the rest of the system. And then I found coming the other direction, I had a similar problem. I tried to have uh, a lane drop and it didn't work with the extra capacity of cars coming in. So they had to extend it through the interchange, and then there was too many lane drops because you have the lane drop of the, the, the free the ramps coming on and that lane ending. So I had to just push it all the way through. Well, then you have another double trap lane again. So at this collector distributor that's three lanes, I had to try to reconfigure it where it adds a additional lane, and then it likes that because then you don't have cars that want to go through stuck in the far right lane because the far right lane doesn't exist yet. So, um, and then push that through the rest of the interchange. Then there's a lane drop on the collector that UDOT's already built for westbound traffic to go northbound on 215. Right in the middle of their bridge, it goes from two lanes to one. Works fine now, does not work with the new volumes. So I had to extend that all the way through. Well, then you're back to a double trap lane again at California, so you have to extend that through the end of the system. And then where you enter going southbound on the 215, you need three lanes to accommodate the volume of traffic that wants to use these new ramps. And that was a double trap lane, so that was a similar situation where you had to push the lane through farther in the system and drop it later. Well, by the time you're done, the existing 215 cross-section, which in most places is about eight lanes, four in each direction, is now 14 lanes. <laughs> and we have to stop and ask ourselves, if we're going to build this thing, is this really what we want to do? Because the truth is, even if we build 14 lanes in a future decade, uh, all 14 lanes will jam. And at least with the current cross-section right now, if you're in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic with four lanes, you can still see the outside world. But if you're stuck in a seven-lane section, all you're going to see is cars. So the added cost you know, will help solve the problem for a while, but it's not going to solve it forever. So this is now, with the, all those improvements put in place with 2036 volumes, you can just sit here and run this VISA model all day long and it uh, doesn't seem to queue or anything, and it seems to work fine. But we have to remember part of why it does that is because now we've pushed these huge cross sections, 10 lanes on the 201 and 14 lanes, all the way to the extents of the study. So 
we just kind of push the problem someplace else. The problem still exists because eventually those lanes have to drop. So final performance benefit within our study area is quite a bit better. Again, if we just left everything alone, the average travel time stay about three times um, for the system as a whole. Um, now it's 114%. Um, so it's only 14% growth in, in delay. And uh, some of the segments actually see some benefit. The through traffic on 215 does a bit better. And part of that is as you're crossing the 201 with current conditions, there's a lot of braking as people weave coming on and off. It doesn't jam, but it definitely slows down. And there, I think there's a lot of lane changes and things I've observed when I've driven it where people might be in the number two lane, and then all of a sudden th that lane gets affected by the weave as people come on and off. So they have to move over to the number three or number four lane, and then that slows those lanes down because they have to slow down to let those cars merge in. Well, that's fixed now. The, the weave isn't affecting those lanes as much. So just to kind of conclude here, there is an improvement if you add all the, build all this stuff. It would take another study to figure out what's the estimated price tag to build all this just because it involves so many new bridges, so much widening, so many reconfiguring lanes, and whether the benefit pays for itself. The other is more lanes on an exit does not necessarily mean less congestion because if you have that double trap lane or one scenario I played with, I had a triple trap lane. Cars go bananas because they, they, even if you warn them ahead of time, you, there's a setting in VISM saying, okay, make your merge half a mile in advance. Well, the VISM drivers, like real drivers, they're not paying attention. So they drive all the way down and they go, oh, uh-oh, this is going on a different freeway. Well, when you have a single trap lane, you just have to make one merge. If you have a double or triple trap lane, even though you have all this great capacity to get cars off, it doesn't necessarily help. And so in a lot of ways, the lane configuration is more important than the capacity that you're providing. And then finally, as I alluded to earlier, we've not solved the congestion. We just pushed it out of the study area. So right now, there's a delay at 9th West, or at Bangor Highway, or at I-80, or at 47th South. And that delay is just going to back right back into our study area. The only reason we don't see it is it's a microscopic model, so you don't see that, that delay back into it. So, questions? It's <laughs> better to invest money in public traffic. Boo! <laughs> this, this would probably be, I imagine, that you could spend half a billion dollars on this thing, you know. And, you know, something needs to be done because those ramps will fail into each other, but the so, what I was thinking you know, the, if there will be a public transit loop, a uh, uh, light rail coming down and then go, um, uh, the BLT will go to the kind of uh, along the what's that? Sometime somewhere between Bangata and then. Oh, 50, 56 uh, West. Yeah. yeah, and if there's a loop, people's travel pattern might change. Like you know, you got the. Tokyo, there's this loop, loop uh, railroad, okay, we call it Yamato line, and crisscrossed by underground, I mean the subways and the other uh, private trains, railroad companies. So if you can provide that you know, infrastructure, I think people will start changing. And, and that would help because uh, it could... A strong politician. <laughs> Right. Well, because if you get the, uh, the, this is assuming a growth of 1.5. Yeah, yeah. And if you're right, if people mode shift to go other ways, or if it just doesn't grow as bad as that, this could continue to work and not have some of the same problems. But if it grows that bad, you know, so. But uh, I think it really changes people's way of uh, thinking about uh, the mobility. I mean, when there's a dude, it becomes really easy. As long as there's a feed along that to make that. Well, that makes some sense because right now you can ride out the West Valley line to the mall, which gets you pretty close to the site, but then you're stuck. You know, if you want to go to any of the other lines or to Sandy, you have to go all the way back into Central Point at 21 and then switch. And people, you're right, won't do that. But if it was a loop, then they could. And that would take cars off the road. 
<laughs> you mentioned this was an industrial area. Having those flyovers, would, those, would that take out some businesses? Um, how I managed to make it fit is you'll notice the, the you keep it kind of tight. See, if I have this like this, and then I, I made the, I, ideally you, you kind of want the, the left to go left and right lane to go right. And I kind of tuck them over each other and that helps save some space. And I think there, there's enough of a buffer with parking lots and that sort of thing. I think you can make it work. And there's room to grow into the median a little bit. Um, they, they haven't totally paved out the 215's median. So I, I, th I think you can squeeze it in. There, I think there's some ways to reconfigure. Um, the other is I kept this ramp here. But now that that clover's gone, you actually could pull this in tight. And then you could shift the whole interchange this way. And so there, there, I think there's some things you could do. It wouldn't be cheap. But uh, yeah, I think they could fit on that. Pretty, pretty close to the existing right away. Yes. They go to the top. And then says the name. Okay. Dark Shutter, do they do clover leaves at all really in Utah anymore or not really? Clover leaf uh, started in New Jersey. It was okay when the volume was low. When it's crowded, it doesn't work. So probably they learn. Nobody saw at a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah. Okay. There you go.